Hello and good afternoon. Welcome back to the Asia Economic Dialogue 2022. I'm Shilpa Fadke, event anchor. We kick off session two with a discussion on economic policy for sustained post-pandemic growth, chaired by Dr. Ajit Ranade, Vice Chancellor at the Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics and member BIC. This session's panelists are the Honorable Mr. Ajit Nivard Cabral, Governor, Central Bank of Sri Lanka, the Honorable Mr. Benjamin E. Diokno, Governor, Central Bank of Philippines, and the Honorable Dr. Michael Patra, Deputy Governor from the Reserve Bank of India. I now invite Dr. Ranade to please start the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Shilpa, and good afternoon to everyone. And welcome to Honorable Governors and Deputy Governor. It's a, it's a delight and privilege to host this panel. And a special welcome from my side as well to Mr. Cabral and Mr. Diokno and uh, Mr. Patra. Uh, this panel is on economic policy post-pandemic, but obviously, uh, give a, you know, the focus will be the monetary policy approach uh, to economic policy. So we'll spend a little more time on the monetary policy aspects of economic policy. And uh, the purpose of this session is to find out uh, what are the different approaches, uh, what has worked, uh, what has not worked. So we need to we need to learn both from our success and, your, and our failures. And going ahead, what is the outlook? I might just spend a minute or two on what I think uh, is the global outlook. Uh, we are, of course, uh, you know, the pandemic is slowly receding away. Uh, not just because of the tremendous uh, vaccine success, it's just incredible vaccine success, the speed of rollout, also because of uh, a lot of fiscal and monetary stimulus went in reviving. So in that sense, the rebound has been quick. Even as we speak, I think the large economies, especially developed economies, have, uh, are showing very strong growth. And that is also helping uh, the global situation on world trade and exports. However, uh, concerns about inflation are emerging in different parts of the world, not just because of uh, pri commodity prices and disruption, but because of demand revival. And uh, this is going to be something that central bankers will have to see. In addition to that, uh, very recently, there are also geopolitical flashpoints and that affect uh, uh, things like uh, oil prices and that makes developing countries more vulnerable, oil importers more vulnerable. So I, I guess we'll be covering all these aspects. So without uh, you know, spending too much time more, uh, I propose the following sequence. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Benjamin Diokno, uh, Central Bank Governor of Philippines, to make his remarks first. I believe, sir, you have a presentation. After that, uh, I'll invite Mr. Cabral to make his remarks, and then uh, Mr. Patra, and then we will have a round of conversations and questions. So I request the panelists to uh, be brief in their initial remarks. I don't know, perhaps about eight to 10 minutes. So over to you, Mr. Diokno. Thank you, Ajit. Uh, good day to all, and thank you for having me here. The Philippine economy entered the COVID-19 crisis in a position of strength. Prior to COVID-19, the Philippine economy had remarkable performance. The economy was growing robustly, averaging at 6.4% annually for a decade, with 84 consecutive quarters of uninterrupted growth rate. That was also one of the highest among ASEAN five countries. The sustained growth momentum was due to expanding productive capacity that benefited from a long track record of purposeful structural and policy reforms that put the Philippines on firmer footing. Reforms that helped strengthen institutions include tax reforms, ease of doing business, and amendments to the Banco Central ng Pilipinas Charter, among others. Strong economic activity was also supported by subdued inflation and the implementation of an ambitious infrastructure program to improve the quality of infrastructure in the country. As a result of the strong economic growth, poverty incidence fell to 16.7% in 2018 from 23.5% in 2015. As with the rest of the world, the pandemic put into a halt any good governance performance. The COVID-19 pandemic adversely affected the Philippine economy and the country experienced a deeper impact due to the implementation of stricter quarantine restrictions that inhibited spending, disrupted supply flows, and resulted in billions of lost income. 
In response, the government has been implementing various measures to mitigate the spread of the virus and restore lost economic output. The severity of the pandemic required a whole of government approach. As such, there was a very close fiscal and monetary coordination. On the part of the BSP or the central bank, we have implemented temporary and time-bound policy measures. First were measures to boost market confidence on availability of low-cost credit resources, such as cuts in the policy rate and the reserve requirement. Lower policy rate was meant to influence banks to cut their own lending rates, thereby promoting credit-taking activities as shown in the previous slide. Meanwhile, lower reserve requirement increased the volume of loanable funds. Second were extraordinary liquidity measures to the national government to help fund the pandemic response measures. These include provisional advances to the national government, purchases of government securities in the secondary market, and remittance of advanced dividends to the national government. Third were regulatory and operational relief measures to maintain stability in the financial system and ensure public access to financial services. We counted loans to micro, small, and medium enterprises as compliance to the reserve requirement. We increased the single borrower's limit and raised the ceiling for real estate loans. Indeed, these measures have proven to be effective. The policy measures help in calming the market, easing the domestic liquidity conditions, and restoring financial market functioning amid the pandemic. The liquidity support to the economy, estimated to reach 11.1% of GDP, has led to a decline in interest rates and has therefore resulted in affordable borrowing costs. This in turn has supported banks' lending capacity and allowed access to credit for households and firms. While uncertainty on the duration of the pandemic had led to slowdown in bank lending in the first half of 2021, the demand for credit by firms and households has been improving recently, as shown by five consecutive months of positive growth in outstanding loans. The reduction of fees for online payment transactions, together with restrictions arising from the pandemic, accelerated the usage of digital financial services. With the provisional advances by the central bank to the national government, it was able to pursue its COVID-related programs. It allowed for budget financing flexibility to the national government, but more importantly, avoided the risk of market volatility. The economy is now recovering. After five quarters of economic contractions, the country's real GDP started to grow in the second quarter of 2021 with 12% growth. Since then, the country has managed to post positive growth rates despite a number of re-implementation of stricter quarantine measures. The latest was at 7.7% in Q4 of 2021, that resulted in a full year growth of 5.6%. The government projects that the Philippine economy will grow by 7 to 9% in 2022 and by 6 to 7% in 2023 and 2024. Employment is also on the rise. In December 2021, the country has continued recovering some of their employment losses during the pandemic. Employment level reached 46.3 million or a 3.7 million net employment gain compared to the pre-pandemic period. The resulting average unemployment rate for 2021 at 7.9% is within the 7 to 9% full year target of the government. The country's inflation is manageable and within the government's target range of 2 to 4 percent. The country's headline inflation slowed down to 3 percent year on year in January 2022, from 3.7 percent in January 3 2021. 
This was mostly driven by slower price increases of selected non-food items, along with alcoholic beverages and tobacco. Private sector economists expect inflation to average 3.5% in 2022, while the mean inflation forecast for 2023 stood at 3.1%. Inflation projections by multilaterals and market analysts for 2022 and 2023 are within our inflation target of 2 to 4%. As we move the economy forward into full recovery from the pandemic, we must also plan to establish normalcy in the conduct of monetary operations. From previous crises, we see that central banks follow a typical sequence for unwinding their interventions. The usual strategy has been to first withdraw any extraordinary measures that exert downward pressure on interest rates before raising the main policy interest rate. In this slide, we show the elements and possible broad sequence of the central bank's exit strategy. The first component involves the recalibration of the BSP's monetary operations, which helps to ensure that our accommodative monetary policy stance is transmitted to the economy through short-term interest rates. Another component involves the unwinding of the measures that infuse liquidity directly into the economy, such as the provisional advances to the national government and the alternative compliance with reserve requirements. The third component entails the reduction in monetary accommodation or the eventual raising of the policy interest rate when prospects for the economy have materially improved. And finally, our exit strategy also involves building on our buffers to ensure that the economy is prepared and resilient in the event that another crisis strikes. We would also like to emphasize that the timing of the exit remains very uncertain at this point, while recent indicators point to a significant recovery of the economy, the threat of further COVID-19 infections continue to pose a downside risk to both growth and inflation in the coming months. Therefore, we deem it prudent to leave some room for flexibility in policymaking to account for uncertainty and risk, especially as the situation remains fluid. The BSP's tapering has already started. The advances to the national government decreased from 540 billion pesos or about 10.5 billion US dollars in July 2021 to 300 billion pesos or 5.8 billion dollars in January 2022 and to zero by Q3 2022. Our purchases in the secondary market has gone down from 19.4% of total government securities portfolio in 2020, year one, 4.8% in 2021, year two, to 0.7% from January to February this year. On the fiscal side, the present administration is crafting a medium-term fiscal consolidation program, which will be which will be turned over to the next administration. The main goal is to progressively cut the deficit to GDP ratio over time. On the monetary side, continuity is assured with my term ending in July 2023. There are two things going for the Philippines. First is the continued confidence in the Philippine economy amid the challenges caused by the pandemic. The country continues to have a favorable medium-term growth prospects based on the stable outlook affirmed by a majority of major credit rating agencies. Fitch ratings affirmed on 18 February, the Philippines credit rating of triple B and not above minimum investment grade, citing economic gains that demonstrate sustained recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. The country has maintained the same rating from FIT fits as with, other rate, as with the ratings of other debt watchers throughout the pandemic, despite a wave of rating downgrades for many other countries during the same period. 
Second, we didn't sit idly by during the pandemic and watch the virus to recede. We pursued game-changing structural reforms. The Retail Trade Liberalization Act, which lowered the minimum paid-up capital for foreign retailers. Second, the amendment to the 80-year-old Public Service Act, which will open up key economic sectors, including telecommunications and airline industries. And thirdly, the amendments to the Foreign Investment Act, which will encourage foreign professionals to bring their practice, know-how, and technical expertise to the Philippines. Fortunately, all three measures are nearing the finish line. Meantime, the BSP is pushing for amendments to the implementing rules and regulations of the Agri-Agra Credit Act of 2009, which allows banks to lend more types of farming communities and classify more loans as compliant with the law's quotas. This could strengthen rural development by providing a holistic approach in addressing the financing needs of the broader agricultural ecosystem. We expect Congress to pass this soon. I'm confident that with these game-changing reforms, we can achieve real change in the lives of ordinary Filipinos through more and better jobs and more competitive economy. Now, similar to our initial responses to pandemic, the sustained growth of the economy would require a whole of government approach. For now, sustained monetary policy support should help the economic recovery gain more traction. On the part of fiscal authorities, the continued implementation of targeted fiscal initiatives and commitment to continue exercising fiscal responsibility should support market confidence and safeguard the economy's momentum. The BSP affirms its support to the economy for as long as necessary to ensure the country's strong and sustainable recovery. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Diokno. Uh, excellent, very crisp presentation, very great uh, you know, ideas that you presented. Uh, one, of the two, one or two things that I took away is the fact that Philippines inflation is actually uh, relatively quite modest compared to some of the peers in the developing. So that is quite, quite remarkable. You said about 3% and so on. And then the other main thing I, I picked up was the coordination between monetary and fiscal authorities, which also is perhaps uh, quite innovative and unconventional. And, uh, you know, as you in the last slide also mentioned that it is still a situation perhaps is not fully robust. Maybe there is some fragility, so we need to be watchful. Uh, but we'll come back to you with some questions, sir. Uh, we will move to uh, Governor Ajit Cabral of Sri Lanka for his initial remarks. Over to you, Mr. Cabral. Uh, we, you have to be... Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me for the Economic Policy for Sustained Post-Pandemic Growth uh, Symposium that you have organized. Let me congratulate the authorities for doing so because I think it's very helpful for us to look at the lessons that we have learned because those will probably help us to face something else that happens in the world and we see so many different things happening all the time. So thank you for organizing this. And the role of the central banks in particular in that context is also very welcome because when Governor Diokno was speaking, I did realize that uh, although there was no discussion of sorts between the governors, uh, the number of areas where there has seems to have been a sort of a planned approach as well, because some of those that uh, the Philippines had uh, executed were areas that we have also given attention to and uh, we have also done because I think uh, those were natural responses. In addition, I must say it is commendable that uh, the Philippines have done a few areas more than what others have done, particularly in the field of uh, ensuring poverty uh, reduction as well as uh, ensuring that your growth levels are sustained. And also how you have contained inflation is exemplary and I want to also congratulate Governor Diokno on that. Let me share a few thoughts about the key principles on which 
we have also worked out during the course of the pandemic. I must admit uh, the brunt of the pandemic uh, reactions were taken over by my predecessor, Governor Lakshman, uh, and I succeeded him in uh, September 2021. But this was my second stint as the governor after having been the governor for a long time before. So coming back to the field, uh, I did realize what a huge challenge my predecessor has faced. And I was at the tail end of that. But nevertheless, I think we are now in the throes of new challenges. And that's also very interesting for us to discuss so that we can see how best are we going to deal with that. The first point was similar to what Governor Diop mentioned is about the stimulating the economy. In times of uh, difficulties, in times of crisis, in times of uncertainty, I think central banks need to stimulate so that we ensure that the robustness of the economy is retained. And uh, pretty much like what the Philippines had done, Sri Lanka also uh, had to do and did. Stimulation of the economy came in the form of uh, supporting the government uh, with liquidity. And that uh, was also to ensure that there is market liquidity. And both those were extremely helpful in ensuring that the market as well as the economy would be on a uh, momentum of sorts. I know it was never going to be of a very high standard, but still it was very, very helpful. Confidence was very helpful to uh, achieve and stimulating the economy uh, allowed central banks to play a very key role in maintain confidence, maintaining the confidence of an economy. And that's something I believe was very important and that was done. The other was the support to the vaccination pro pro program. Many uh, central banks, I think, supported it, and we were also instrumental in doing so to ensure that the country's uh, large number of people, as many as possible, were vaccinated, and that was a big challenge, and we all supported that. The other was, I think, dealing with the lockdowns. Initially, we all had a uh, feeling that lockdowns would uh, ensure that uh, the virus spread could be contained, and to some extent, it did. But while lives were saved, livelihoods were affected very, very badly. And I think that's one of the lessons that we will probably learn and we'll have to deal with that situation in the future as well. Livelihoods are so important that if livelihoods are not uh, taken into consideration for the equation, that it can do as much damage as lives being lost as well. I think that's uh, something that we experienced at the initial stages of the lockdown. Many people were affected very, very badly. And to deal with that, uh, the moratoriums that were brought in were helpful. Sri Lanka had moratoriums which uh, provided support to about 40% of the total lending. And that was enormous support. And the most moratoriums are going to be unwound by 31st of March, 2022. And that's after two years. So for two years, we have had to deal with the moratoriums. And now we are working out schemes as to how the moratorium could have a soft landing. And that's also as important. What would be the way in which the people who have had a relief for such a long period of time, what would be the way that they would be nursed back in their businesses to meet with the challenge of repayment whilst the economy was on the recovery takeoff position as well. So that's another interesting balance for us to manage. Uh, we have gathered a vast amount of data on this subject, and we are about to introduce the moratorium relief package that would help the soft landing of all the people who have been affected and who now need to start repaying. And that, mind you, has to be done without undue burdens being cast upon the banks and the financial institutions, as well as having a balance of the businesses as well. And that's an interesting um, balance. And we would be um, uh, very conscious of the fact that that would be something that we'll have to nurture back. The other matter that we have to always remember is that at some stage, the stability has to be maintained always, but some stage we have to get back to growth as well. And Governor Diokto enunciated that very well. Sri Lanka also had a sharp uh, downturn in the uh, second quarter of 2020, uh, 2020 uh, which was about 18% drop in our growth, a negative growth. Then thereafter, from the third to fourth quarters of 2020, there was an uh, uptick. Once again, in the first quarter of 2021, there was a downturn. 
So it was a bit of a roller coaster ride. But nevertheless, uh, I think we finished 2020 with a negative growth of 3.6%, but we'll probably have about a 4% growth in 2021. And we are now looking at seeing as to how we could achieve the 5% growth that we have set ourselves as the target to be achieved in 2022. Now, in so doing, we have several challenges that we have to meet. One is the challenge of inflation. We are not as fortunate as uh, Governor Diopno. Uh, we have seen some of the imported inflation coming into our system as well, and that is posing quite a bit of challenge. And that, mind you, is now a question of as to how to deal with this whole situation, the inflation expectations. We are seeing inflation uh, rising, but we see a major component of that not being internally driven, not being demand-driven, demand but driven by outside factors. So that inflation expectations to be managed is also an important part. And the next big challenge is the rollback of the expansionist policies, the liquidity support. We have again started off on a fairly engine program of gently ensuring that the excesses that have been put into the system in order to stimulate are pulled back without making the market get too unduly uh, complicated or uh, into any difficulty. The next point I would like to talk about is international support. I believe uh, very sincerely that the support that came from international quarters was too little and too late. Many countries suffered from ratings downgrades and they were having serious liquidity constraints in the initial stages of the pandemic because IMF also acted quite late. IMF did realize that there was a problem as early as March or April 2020, but they reacted only in August 2021. It was a long time later. During that period, the imperfections as well as the vulnerabilities grew in almost all these economies. Had they addressed it early, it is very uh, clear that the, some of the difficulties that got festered within economies could have been contained to a great extent. But anyway, better late than never, they say. Uh, we did see the IMF uh, package, the additional allocations coming in. That did help, no doubt. But I believe that when it came too late, it also served to fuel some inflation in my view. So that's something that we should think through in the, in the, in, in the future as to the timing of any particular type of support that is being given on a global scale. If it comes too late at the time of recovery, it can lead to additional inflation. And to some extent, I believe the current situation of uh, high rates of inflation being uh, suffered by many countries across the world is as a result of that situation. But I did see a silver lining of regional cooperation, particularly in Sri Lanka, we saw uh, regionally many countries uh, being uh, uh, standing up, particularly from India, as well as China. There were several countries that came forward to be of support to uh, emerging nations. And that's something I believe was a very interesting development that emanated imme immediately after the pandemic. So that's a sign we, where we do recognize that countries can come together and deal with issues on a collective basis. And I believe that's a very helpful sign as well. The final part of what I would like to tell you, governor, uh, uh, governors as well as uh, chairman, is to uh, share with you a few lessons that I believe uh, are helpful in going forward and in dealing with this kind of situation for the future. First, I think it's important that we have quick policy implementation. The time lag between a policy formulation and policy uh, implementation should be narrowed down as much as possible in times of crisis. And that did, was seen in many economies. And I, I think that's something that we need to document carefully and to have as a uh, support for our future reactions as well as interventions that in times of crisis, that should be done. The second, I think we got, if you're erring, err on the side of more than less. Sometimes policy stimuli, uh, policy support can be moderate or can be somewhat excessive. But I think one of the lessons that we learned was if you need to uh, 
don't err on the side of less, but err on the side of more. If it's more, you can always pull back, but if it's too little, it may be wasted. So I think uh, we did see that happening in various policy interventions that we did also. Wherever it was uh, a little more, it did, uh, we, we felt that the reactions were a lot better. And, and if we do find that we need to pull it back, we could pull it back as well. The third is we should have several policy options. If you have several, some will work, some won't. We were in uncharted territory. When you are in uncharted territory, sometimes you don't know exactly which way to steer and what needs to be done. So when you are in that kind of a situation, I think central banks also took the position that we need to do uh, certain things and some actually did not work as well. And those, uh, maybe we can, during the course of the discussions, we can see how best we are going to deal with that. But some worked. So if you have several, uh, there is always a chance that at least some will work and uh, that would be best as far as everyone is concerned. The fourth is we need to have a lot of coordination between fiscal as well as, uh, uh, as, well as the uh, uh, monetary authorities. And that's important one. Think out of the box. And I think when you are do having stimuli, think of the winding down as well at the time that you're initiating it. So uh, I, I think I took a little more time than I should have, uh, Chairman. I for, please forgive me for that. But I think it, this was uh, helpful to uh, set the grounds uh, for our future discussions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Cabral. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, in fact, I must mention that while we have three central bank governors or deputy governor, uh, there are a few important differences. So let me allow me one minute. Uh, I, I, I couldn't help but notice, Governor Cabral, that some of the issues that you flagged were slightly different. For example, in Governor Diokno, uh, I noticed uh, that the inflation was fairly modest as compared to other countries, whereas Sri Lanka, the challenge is of higher inflation. And you did point out that the source of that inflation is actually external, much of it is external. To some extent, I think it may be the case with India, but I don't want to anticipate what uh, Governor Patra is going to say. But I also, would, I, can't hesit, I, I can't resist but comment that uh, each of you three have fairly different uh, uh, you know, backgrounds. Uh, I think uh, Governor Diokno has been, he's also a professor, so he's very professorial. And uh, he's also, I think he's written textbooks as well. Uh, whereas uh, Governor Cabral has actually served in the parliament. He's been a member of parliament. And as he himself said, this is his second innings. I think probably very few people in the world, very few governors in the world have come back for a second innings and that too with the considerable, uh, and, but I must also mention that Governor Cabral is also an author. And as far as uh, Mr. Patra is concerned, I won't say much because uh, you know, I'll be revealing too much, but I would like to mention that he's an avid sports person also and a very good cricketer. So over to you, Mr. Patra, for your brief remarks and then we'll come back to the conversation. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your very kind remarks. Uh, thank you for having me on this very distinguished panel. Uh, listening to Governor Diokno on the Philippine experience and to Governor Cabral on the Sri Lankan experience has been extremely educative. Now, I, I have to mention that I have seen Governor Cabral at work in his first innings, and I have seen him transform Sri Lanka into a, a modern middle income emerging economy. I think at that time, uh, Sri Lanka issued its first euro bond, sovereign bond issue, under his watch. Uh, 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 among central banks, you will find a considerable amount of uh, cross-fertilization and learning from each other's experience. So when I speak on the Indian experience, uh, I might be faulted for sounding extremely familiar to what you've just heard, but please bear with me. Uh, so let me start with a few uh, remarks on uh, uh, what measures that uh, uh, were taken by India during the pandemic and how, how we evaluate them today. So the dec declaration of COVID-19 as a pandemic by the World Health Organization on March 10th, 2020, was uh, followed by a nationwide lockdown in India on March 24. Uh, arguably, it was the strictest in the world, but paradoxically, it set off one of the biggest human migrations in human history. People fled cities to villages in fear of what they at that time thought was an urban disease, only to find that the virus pursued them into the hinterland. Financial markets in India went into seizure. Extreme risk aversion gripped financial institutions. 
and liquidity dried up. Financial distress spread to small and medium businesses, households, and even individuals who were afflicted by the pandemic. So a health crisis rapidly morphed into a financial and macroeconomic crisis. Before the onset of the pandemic, monetary policy was already in accommodative mode, having reduced the policy rate by a cumulative 135 basis points up until February 2020. Massive amounts of liquid injections had been made, so much that uh, uh, the RBI was re receiving deposits of uh, equivalent to nearly $42 billion on a daily basis, just ahead of the pandemic. As the first wave of the pandemic intensified, the Monetary Policy Committee met in an advanced off-cycle meeting on March 27th. I quote the committee, the need of the hour is to do whatever is necessary to shield the domestic economy from the pandemic. So in quick su succession, the policy rate was reduced by about 115 basis points that took the cumulative reduction to a 250 basis points reduction. Uh, the floor of the interest rate corridor was reduced by 155 basis points, rendering the corridor asymmetric. In effect, the corridor itself was used as an instrument. Overnight rates and soon other money and bond rates converged to the floor of the corridor under the weight of the liquidity which we uh, uh, put into the system. And uh, uh, the floor became the corridor, uh, the floor became the effective policy rate. This floor system, as opposed to a corridor channel system, was actually in operation in many countries in the world during the pandemic. Regular liquidity operations were bolstered by cutting the cash reserve ratio requirement. Long-term repo operations, both system level and targeted to specific sectors, institutions, and instruments. Uh, special liquidity facilities were made available to mutual funds and primary dealers, which in hindsight, uh, averted panic in equity and bond markets. When high risk aversion among banks impeded the flow of central bank liquidity to the distressed entities and sectors, the RBI put in place a panoply of uh, lines of credit to long-term refinancing institutions, to on-lend to rural credit institutions, MSMEs, microfinance, small finance banks, non-bank financial companies, and housing finance companies. Uh, special windows were open for health services and contact intensive services. And banks were told that if they didn't want to use central bank liquidity because they were flush with liquidity themselves, they could use their own liquidity but avail of incentives from the RBI. Asset purchase programs were put in place to undertake large acquisitions of government bonds so as to keep yields low. Uh, the result has been that cumulatively, liquidity support of the order of 8.7% of GDP was offered and 5.9% was utilized. Financial markets unfroze quickly and began functioning under pandemic protocols and uh, restricted market hours. Financial institutions remained operational and in good health. Illiquidity risks ebbed as the lifeblood of finance started to flow to various sectors, especially the disadvantaged and badly hit Market panic, bank runs, and disorderly market movements were avoided while confidence was showed up. Uh, liquidity, uh, our liquidity operations ensured the lowest borrowing costs in decades and brought about compression of spreads across rating categories. This, in fact, allowed the government to borrow at low cost to fund a fiscal stimulus of 11.4% of GDP delivered over two years. Corporations replaced high cost debt, reduced leverage, and built up retained earnings as sales slowly started to pick up after the first uh, wave lows. For banks and financial institutions, liquidity operations, regulatory forbearance, and recovery operations kept non-performing assets low, preemptive provisioning high, and enabled a return to profitability. Uh, there was very close and continuous coordination between the government and the RBI throughout this pandemic response. The RBI not only suggested but was also consulted on several fiscal measures. The timings of our announcements were adjusted to de derive the maximum announcement effects. In several windows that uh, RBI provided uh, uh, liquidity, the operations of the RBI were complemented by guarantees offered by the government to collateral, for collateral free loans to various small entities which were affected by the pandemic. 
the government also provided interest rate subventions, which lowered debt servicing costs. On its part, the RBI is the issuer of the government's debt, ensured the smooth passage of the government's borrowing program, both of national and subnational governments, while elongating the maturity of public debt. On, on, the, uh, on the path that monetary policy will take going into the future, I thought I would uh, uh, sort of uh, place my, situate my remarks in a global context because uh, I think India will take a part which will be different from the rest of the world. Uh, in fact, uh, as the pandemic continues to shape the global outlook, macroeconomic profiles are differing widely across the world, depending on, in my view, on two main factors the size and staying power of monetary and fiscal stimuli and the access to vaccines. Consequently, monetary policy, which has a predominantly domestic orientation, is taking very, very different roads across jurisdictions. In the polarized debate that is going on worldwide between team transitory and team permanent on inflation, team transitory seems to be getting bulldozed into a minority and pushed into a corner. Meanwhile, as increasing number of central banks tighten monetary policy or indicate intent to normalize, financial conditions are hardening globally and markets are turning increasingly volatile. To my mind, this is the biggest risk to the global recovery and may even tip it into a premature recession. Let me elaborate this further because I know I'm making uh, slightly different remarks than what you've heard in the narrative today. On global inflation, my, remark, my view is that we are paying the price of bounding too quickly out of the pandemic's downturn. The overall policy response to the pandemic has found it easier to revive revenge spending than to bring supply capacities on stream. Consequently, even a weak uptick in demand is appearing excessive in the face of supply constraints. The pandemic has also caused supply capacities to be in the wrong places. Illustratively, there has been a surge in the demand for manufactured goods, but an evaporation of demand for contact intensive services. The result is supply snarls in goods and excess capacity in services. Monetary policy as an instrument of stabilization works by adjusting demand to the level of supply, not the other way around. Consequently, efforts to address immediate inflation pressures that we are seeing today all over the world and caused by supply bottlenecks that keep aggregate supply below recovering demand may not work. Given the lags with which monetary policy operates, today's actions can at best be expected to impact inflation six to 12 months down the line. So what will be the character of inflation six to 12 months ahead? Any projection available today shows inflation peaking in the middle of 2022 and easing thereafter. The OECD estimates that half of global inflation is due to supply chain disruptions, port congestion, shipping charges, and shortage of key intermediates like semiconductors and chips. The New York, New York Fed's global supply chain pressures index is peaking and is set to moderate from here on. Moreover, it is important to uh, be cognizant of what is called the bullwhip effect. As demand gets stronger, finished goods inventories, which are piled up with wholesalers and retailers, will be released into the market. And along with the easing of supply chain problems, there will be a supply glut. New orders will not go up at that time, and activity will slow. At that time, today's monetary policy measures may bite, but they will not impact inflation, which is set to ease anyway by the second half of 2022. Instead, they will kill the recovery. India's inflation dynamics are different from the rest of the world. Early during the onset of the pandemic, India got a bout of high and persistent food inflation. Uh, just to keep this perspective, close to 48% of our uh, CPI is food. But determined supply side responses to augment the supply of inflation sensitive commodities, including long term contracts for imports uh, uh, for, uh, for pulses and oil seeds drastically reduced tariffs and incentives to boost productivity broke the back of this price surge and tamed inflation. Cuts in excise duties on petroleum products are still working their way through the economy and keeping these pressures subdued. In the case of India, wage growth and house rentals 
the second order effects that uh, that uh, plague the inflation spiral have not yet barked. Firms are exhibiting low pricing power due to substantial slack in the economy and are not passing on input costs to selling prices. Consequently, the level of inflation in India, which is measured on a year-on-year -year basis, is appearing elevated, but that is purely due to statistical base effects. The momentum or month-to-month -month changes in inflation are negative and pulling down inflation. Our sense is that headline inflation has peaked in January, and from here on, it will ease down to the target of 4% by the last quarter of 2022. And this has provided us the space to maintain policy rates low and persevere with an accommodative stance so that we can focus all energies on accelerating and broadening the recovery. Just a few last remarks uh, that I thought might be useful. A feature of India's experience, I think, which is noteworthy, is that there is a flexibility which is embedded into the monetary policy framework which helped us deal with this once in a century crisis. Uh, this is what the F in FIT or flexible inflation targeting uh, is, is stands for in India. And it is characterized by one, a dual mandate, which is price stability, keeping in mind the objective growth of growth, but only price stability gets a numeral, numerical target. Number two, an inflation target that is defined in averages rather than a point. Number three, achievement of the target over a period of time rather than continuously. Number four, a reasonably wide ba a tolerance band of plus minus 2% to accommodate measurement issues, forecast errors, supply shocks, and as vividly demonstrated recently, black swan events like the pandemic. And five, failure being defined as three consecutive quarters of deviation from the tolerance band rather than every deviation from the target. Significantly, but Underplayed is the fact that there is no escape clause. A similar flexibility is imbued by the liquidity management framework, including allowing us to uh, run an asymmetrical corridor and use the liquidity tool, liquidity corridor itself, as a policy tool. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I think I'll stop here and wait for the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patra. Actually, very sharp, very forceful points and uh, very unconventionally specific. Uh, you might invite some headlines tomorrow. But I'm going to quickly, uh, you know, ask some questions, and I'll request the panelists to keep their uh, response very brief. Some of the questions may be provocative, but please bear with me. So, first, uh, Governor Diokno, uh, you you mentioned that uh, fiscal monetary coordination is uh, something I picked up, which is which seems to be very specific to Philippines, uh, and in fact, uh, perhaps it has helped in dealing with the pandemic. But in doing so, uh, I noticed that in the last three years or four years, your debt to GDP ratio has gone from something like 36, 37% to almost, I believe, 60% or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, your foreign debt to GDP ratio is at 27%. Mm -hmm. So do you think that uh, the fiscal response, I know you are a central bank governor, so you can't speak for the fiscal authorities. But can you comment on whether this uh, has become a worry point for the Philippines mm -hmm. uh, economy? Okay, thank, thank you for that question. Uh, actually, uh, I'm in a very uh, favorable position to talk about that because I was budget secretary for that's right for the yeah. administration. So I know the yes. fiscal side and I know the monetary side. Yes. So is that a is that a threat? I don't think so. I think uh, sixty percent the GDP ratio is 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 fairly manageable compared to other countries. And you mentioned our foreign debt to GDP ratio is less than 30%. And um, I think our the, the solution really is just, we have to outgrow our debt. And because there's no alternative, we really have to borrow money, otherwise uh, we'll, we'll, we'll still be stuck with, with COVID, right? I think it yes. was the right thing to do, borrow money at at favorable rates, you won't believe this. We were able to raise some some funds long term at 0.25 percent interest. I think we have to give credit wow. to our finance secretary. He was able to to tap sources from abroad at very favorable rates. So, so no, no, we don't see it as a problem. Okay, that's incredible. We should invite your finance secretary to give some talks in New Delhi. <laughs> uh, um, 
Well, one more point very quickly, Governor Diokno, is that uh, the other two speakers uh, spoke about a moratorium as one of the several instruments used by monetary authority. That is to say, during for almost one year or longer, the central bank, which is also a regulatory agency, uh, decided that they would uh, the NPA norm, non-performing loan norms, were suspended, and therefore it was like a moratorium. I didn't men I didn't hear any mention of moratorium in your talk. So the, the Philippines did not find it necessary to use that tool. No, we have. We also have. Uh, you know, our central bank has, has mul multiple functions, and as you mentioned, that's also regulation is part of our function. And so we had moratorium for 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 our banks, and. Uh, Despite that, I think that our NPL is at the moment less than 5%. And we don't see this going into double digit level as we've seen during the Asian financial crisis. And now during the Asian financial crisis, we have this law passed uh, where you can up upload your, your uh, bad debt to a corporation. As that's this, oh. um, but this, this time, we were able to pass a similar law exactly during the year of the crisis. It's in other words, it's a fallback position. And I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure that not many banks will avail of that because they, they are in a pretty good position. And that's also partly because we have prepared them even before the crisis. I think uh, their capital adequacy ratio is fairly high and uh, compared to other, during other times. Well, I know exactly. I mean. Just prior to the pandemic, the Philippines' performance was very impressive. As you mentioned, 84 consecutive quarters of growth, nearly 7%. And I believe your uh, per capita income PPP terms is close to $10,000, which is the envy of many developing countries. Let me turn to Governor Cabral. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you were uh, distressed, I think, when you said the global coordination uh, did not was not as forthcoming or... And I think uh, perhaps you were also referring to the fact that during the 2008 crisis, there was much more uh, visible and conscious coordination of global policies, including fiscal policies. So um, what is the reason you think that this time, even though on the vaccine front, there's been an incredible amount of global cooperation, uh, but uh, you said that um, Sri Lanka especially felt the brunt of lack of uh, external help or coordination. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, uh, in my view, the uh, global support came in quite late. Actually, they did deal with the countries which were at the bottom end of the spectrum, where they were the poorer countries were assisted. However, the market access countries, the emerging nations, they were, I think they fell between the stools. And there wasn't enough support for those countries which had been familiar with market access and when the market access was not available, they did have to undergo some serious uh, uh, tensions in their economies. And it, that was exacerbated by rating agencies also taking a view that there was this risk which was growing. And as a result of that, that also hurt further. So I believe that situation wasn't sufficiently coordinated. And the fact that the global agencies did not respond quickly enough compared to what did happen, uh, Chairman Ajit, as you might quite rightly mention, in 2008 and 2009 during the global crisis, uh, that was quite visible. And I believe some of the tensions that most of these countries of the emerging nation bracket were facing was as a result of that situation. So perhaps uh, that is a lesson for us to uh, learn that any global response needs a global quick response, uh, global pandemic or global crisis needs a global response. Because if you are to vaccinate, you got to vaccinate all, not only those who are ill or those who are exposed to the virus. In the same way, when you are giving a vaccination, a kind of a vaccination on a global scale to economies, you need to do that to everyone. And if you don't do that, then some will uh, unnecessarily be uh, feeling the tension, which can sometimes be quite damaging in the longer term. So that's the point that I was making. And uh, I believe uh, that should be addressed in any type of situation in the future. I, I think, yeah, I agree that uh, in uh, 2008, 
uh, Governor Bush, uh, sorry, uh, President Bush, who was actually on his way out, uh, called an emergency meeting of the G20 in November, uh, even after the elections when President-elect Obama was already, and he, I think that uh, gave the impetus for global uh, coordination, both in fiscal and monetary policy, which was missing perhaps uh, this time. And Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka's experience, I must say, has been very different, for example, from Philippines. So we'll come back to the your your topic of you know you hinted at this uh, sort of why asymmetric and uh, response. But I, let me turn to uh, 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 Governor Patra. Actually, this is a question specific to India, and so you'll have to bear with me. I'll take the liberty, and <laughs> you can choose to dodge it. It's come from the chat box. Uh, See, unlike uh, Philippines, I think there is talk that Philippines is on its way to normalizing, and Governor Diokno also hinted at it. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the Sri Lankan situation is very different. But India certainly, you know, with growth outlook being strong, and you you mentioned that uh, the inflation uh, numbers are merely a base effect. Then uh, there is a perception that uh, the central bank is uh, perhaps falling behind in the sense of uh, not uh, not gearing up and not returning to normal quickly. Is that a fair charge or if, if it's not, how would you defend it? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think the public uh, view is uh, unfair because uh, every judgment must be based on facts, I think. So if you look at the facts, uh, remember that India had the deepest recession in the world. The only other country which had a higher recession was Peru. And if you knock out the fiscal stimulus, India exceeds the depression of Peru. So we have dug out of the deepest recession in the world. Today, uh, you know, 21-22 is estimated to close with a GDP growth rate of 9.2. But most people don't focus on the fact that at this rate of growth, India is only 1% above pre-pandemic levels of GDP. And if you, if you actually take, uh, you know, we were actually slowing even before the pandemic in a cyclical downturn, which started in 17. If you extend that slowing line into a trend and place the actual GDP against it, we have lost at least 10 to 15% of our output forever. We will never gain it back. So that is where India stands in terms of its growth rate. As a uh, you have correctly pointed out that inflation is uh, a case of statistical effects in India. And as I said, if you look at the momentum, it is actually declining. So, uh, so uh, India is in a comfortable position as far as inflation is concerned. And since that is there, we have the headroom to support growth. And we will do so because we are uh, dealing with lost output, lost livelihoods, as governors mentioned themselves. So I think it is a uh, unfair judgment, but uh, RBI uh, reserves the right to choose its time to normalize. No, very, very strongly, very, very well made, uh, Mr. Patra, because this point, people uh, people forget that after two years, India's GDP is barely 1% above the pre-pandemic level, even with the wild swing, as you said, of minus nine to plus nine or something like that. And the fact that unlike Philippines, which was actually roaring, Prior to the pandemic for three, four years, India's growth rate was uh, declining. And I must say that on this panel, all three countries have had very different experiences, both pre-pandemic and, and during the pandemic. But I'm going to pose a question which is common to all three. And uh, I will let uh, you know whoever wants to jump in, because this is a question which is generic to monetary policy and perhaps it affects the developed as well as developing countries. This is the charge that uh, loose monetary policy, extremely accommodative and high liquidity pumping in, actually has ended up benefiting the higher income brackets, especially the top deciles. That's because this money in the absence of investment uh, uh, demand or investment enthusiasm is finds its way to asset markets, notably stock markets or perhaps real estate. So those prices go up and that is typically the ownership of those assets is in the higher income bracket. So in fact, willy-nilly, uh, monetary policy by being too accommodative has helped, uh, has caused a worsening of uh, income or wealth inequality. Um, this may be, the experience may be different across different countries, I know, 
but uh, this is a question which certainly central bankers uh, should be worried about. So this is a question to all three of you, whoever, maybe I'll ask Mr. Jokno to go first on this. Do you agree with this thesis or is it overstated? And if it's not, if you agree, then what should you do? No, first of all, uh, when, because of what we've done, we have, we are able to, to, to uh, manage our inflation. And you'll agree with me that it is the poor who benefits from, from uh, low inflation. Low inflation, right? absolutely. Yeah. Correct, because, because of their fixed income, so that they benefit from that. And on the other hand, whether they are, they are the, the rich people benefited from this, if you're referring to uh, the uh, higher uh, asset prices, like re I'm sure real estate prices in the US, in UK, in China, in, in many places have gone up. But surprisingly in the Philippines, it has been steady. And in fact, it's for, for areas outside Metro Manila, it has even gone down. So I don't oh. think that, that that is true in the Philippines. Oh, okay. Very interesting. I, I must say this is really quite out. I guess an outlier. I wanted to say outstanding, but outlier for sure. Uh, Governor Cabral, do you have any comment on this? Uh, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting proposition. You see, central banks have certain instruments which they are not in a position to use in a manner which is only benefiting a particular segment. When you have interest rates, policy rates increased, it benefits or has an effect on everyone. If you do a SRR change, that also has an effect on everyone. Sometimes, depending on the particular time, there can be some who are benefiting more than the others or some who are being adversely affected more than the others. So I think uh, it's a little bit unfair for people to believe that there is a possibility of targeting a specific segment of the population when you take certain central bank measures. So that's a challenge and sometimes people do interpret it on those lines and then accuse central banks of uh, doing more for one segment than the other. But I think central banks take a more macro picture. And when you take a macro picture, uh, that's the way it works and some may benefit a little more than others. Some may be more, adver uh, more adver adversely affected. But that's the way it goes because if it is beneficial from the overall macro, that's the way central banks generally work. Sabata, inequality. Are you causing more inequality, wealth inequality? Uh, um, yes, I have followed this debate uh, very interestedly. And uh, uh, in, in, in normal times, if central banks started talking about inequality, they would be accused of mission creep because that's not their job. Uh, uh, typically, fiscal policy is the redistributive instrument through tax and expenditure. And uh, it is amazing that the world uh, did not heap the accusation of inequality at the fiscal door, despite massive fiscal stimuli, and, and chose to land it at the door of monetary policy. My only submission would be that monetary policy is a very blunt instrument. It is not a fine-tuning instrument designed to achieve equality. Governor Yurtno was spot on when he spoke about inflation, uh, the, the address of monetary, the primary address of monetary policy, and it is the biggest redistributive tool, completely biased to the poor. So that should be kept in mind. Remember that we were in extraordinary times. Typically, central banks take the back seat. They, they stay in the dark depths not to be noticed, and they only rise to the light when Times are not good. But since the global financial crisis, they have been the knights in shining armor. They have rushed to the front line first, and they have been expected to do so. In the pandemic too, they were at the front line first. And there are many consequences of monetary policy that follow. But monetary policy is not the instrument to uh, address inequality, in my opinion. I think you're, you're right. It's, uh, uh, if at all there is an effect, it's totally inadvertent. And uh, rightfully, the fiscal authorities have to be seized of this matter. And you know, new instruments like UBI, universal basic income, should, should of course be explored. So we are uh, running out of, uh, we, have, we have five, six minutes more. So I will, plead, I will request the panelists to be very brief, but I cannot, we cannot uh, conclude the session without being a little futuristic. 
So let me begin with uh, uh, Governor Diokno again. I think uh, a few months ago, you mentioned that uh, Philippines is going to uh, issue or embark upon central bank digital currency. And uh, you were one of the first countries to mention the central bank currency the, uh, based on blockchain. But lately, I believe uh, there's a clear signal that we, you want to introduce it. Um, so has there been a change in your thinking or are you just postponing your decision? What is the situation? No, a few years. Oh, well, I've been central bank governor on, for only three years. Uh, early on, I said we will study. And so I created a task force to look into it. And right now, there, to me, there's no urgency for a CBDC because our payment and the settlement system is working quite well. And so we will we'll let it uh, uh, advance. In fact, uh, my, my goal is uh, to have at least 50% uh, or more than half of all financial transactions in the country to be in digital form. And we're fairly close to it. I mean, right now it's around 30% uh, after two years. And I think it will be a, we will, we will accomplish it because of the pandemic. I think people now are, have embraced the digitalization journey. So, so on CBDC, it's still on the table, but uh, we, it's not a major priority at the moment. Okay, and by the way, one thing I must mention, even though the three, the experience of all these three economies is different, whether it's inflation or debt to GDP ratio or exchange rates. But one thing which is common to Philippines, India, and Sri Lanka is the huge, uh, you know, huge uh, support that you get from non-resident remittances. I mean, right. all three countries are leaders. And actually cross-country transfer of cryptocurrency uh, is a serious, uh, you know, is, will, will be quite a serious affair if you allow the remittances to use uh, crypto. So let me turn to uh, Mr. Patra, and then I think the last word will be with uh, Mr. Cabral. So Mr. Patra, uh, just to change the tone a little bit, I know that the India Central Bank has already announced that uh, Central Bank Digital Currency, uh, I think a sandbox or something, and then we had the Finance Minister also mention it. But in the, at the same time, we've introduced a 30% uh, tax on cryptocurrency asset trading or crypto asset trading. And then somebody asked the finance minister, uh, does that mean that you are legalizing it because you're taxing it? Uh, she said, uh, I think something like that. No, that doesn't make it legitimate. So of course you're not here on, to speak on her behalf, but what is the India central bank's uh, uh, attitude when it comes to uh, crypto assets and uh, how soon are you going to proliferate central bank digital currency? So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman for uh, permitting me not to take on <laughs> finance ministry has already taken on. Uh, what I will do is I will uh, stick to the rest of what she said and that uh, was said in a budget speech that India will issue a CBDC by, uh, during 2023. We are completely set on that goal. Uh, I, as you know, uh, in India, we have CBDC in some form at the wholesale level uh, for, for the banks and all that. So the wholesale is actually done and dusted. We, we don't need to do much. It's the retail CBDC, which is uh, the issue. And I think we will proceed very gradually. We will cross the river by feeling the pebbles. There are issues of privacy that are involved. There are issues of monetary policy transmission that are involved. Uh, there is also an issue of energy intensity of the whole process, if it is on a certain kind of technology. So at this time, uh, what I would say is that we are proceeding very, very slowly. We will measure our steps and very uh, calibratedly move in the direction. And what about uh, banks lending money to buy crypto assets? Yeah, uh, I, as you know, the crypto asset debate is still on in India. And there are various sides to it. So uh, RBI's view is quite known actually on, on crypto. I think it is, it is uh, one of the views that has actually delayed a bill on that, uh, on that uh, subject. So, but we will we will engage in a in a fair debate, and uh, we will look at all sides of the of the debate. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, for the benefit of Mr. Diokno and Mr. Cabral, I must mention that Mr. Patra's boss, the governor, recently made a statement in the Indian press saying, "Oh, crypto has no nothing, no foundation, not even a tulip." So the vast masses in India they they started looking up Wikipedia. What is a tulip? 
because it it, it grows only in the in the northernmost part of the country. So tulips became popular. So Mr. Cabral, uh, you have the last word, if I may say. Uh, I want to combine uh, this remittance uh, aspect of Sri Lankan economy, which is a significant dependence and important dependence, with the fact that your uh, exchange rate, you know, we have not discussed exchange rate at all during this session for lack of time. But I think for Sri Lanka, the exchange rate movements have been a big worry. And it's related to monetary policy. It's related to trying to cut down on non-essential imports uh, and pay for oil imports. And you had, a, I think, a tough balancing act. I believe you had to uh, intervene in credit decisions of banks, uh, whether to give to the Petroleum Corporation or something. So um, in the post, you know, as we recover from the pandemic, uh, what will the central bank do to balance the need of a stable or a stronger currency exchange rate, uh, the need to attract more remittances, but at the same time, not to become uncompetitive domestically? I know it's, a, it's like asking you to write a thesis, but anyway. It's, it's a well-rounded question, and I'll try to uh, sort of decipher it. Uh, when we look at the uh, unwinding process, we see that there is a lot of liquidity out there which has uh, also created a pent-up demand to be now fulfilled by many people who have the cash. So as a result, we have seen our imports surging and we need to now balance that to some extent and that's been yeah. something of a concern for us and we are handling that. At the same time, as you mentioned, about $60 billion in Sri Lanka's economy of about $85 billion, uh, about $60 billion of transactions take place at the normal exchange rate. But a certain quantum of uh, transactions, which is about one and a half billion dollars, does take place at the other unofficial rate, which is uh, the exchange rate that those people are, uh, are talking about. So therefore, there is this feeling that if we were to go into that particular exchange rate, that there could be more coming in. But actually, that's a fallacy that lots of people are having in their minds. And we are trying our best to make sure that people don't move into, into the, that territory. So that's, again, another challenge that we are facing, that we sort of subside the uh, equation. Because we, have, we did see some re reduction in the remittance, but that is not entirely due to the fact that people are using the illegal or informal channels. There has been a reduction in the numbers of people who are going abroad as well. And that has been one of the reasons why that has happened. So uh, your uh, question, which has several uh, uh, twists, uh, I'm afraid I may not have touched on every item, but uh, no, it no. does uh, give you a little bit of insight about the way we are moving in that uh, whole uh, question. Thank you. Thank you. I think you've done that. You've done admirably. But, uh, uh, you know, I, nobody, nobody, I don't think most people don't envy uh, your jobs, gentlemen. So, uh, you know, I wish you all the very best. And as we come out of the pandemic, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Shilpa, our anchor. So thank you all for being wonderful panelists. Thank you. Great. Thank product. you very much. very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranade. Thank you very much, governors, for your presentations. You've given us many learnings and policy considerations going forward. Thank you once again. Uh, dear audience, our next session, uh, session three, the last one for the day, begins in about 30 minutes. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thank you.